Did homosexuality kill the dinosaurs? You might think you know the answer, but first, consider the perspective of the very weird early 90s sitcom Dinosaurs, featuring giant Jim Henson puppets that tackled timely topics like war and drugs and race, and yes, they even had an episode with a thinly veiled metaphor for homosexuality, along with parents who overcome intolerance. And in a weird twist, the episode echoes theories about real-life dinosaur behavior that were put forward by a real-life gay Transylvanian dinosaur hunter a hundred years ago. All aboard, and welcome to a truly wild episode of Culture Cruise, where we dive deep on LGBTQ milestones in entertainment. And by the way, big thanks to everyone who makes Culture Cruise possible on Patreon, folks like Ross Gibson, Holly the Small, and David N. If you're enjoying these videos, head over to Patreon to check out the rewards for backers, and hit the subscribe bell for more videos like this. So let's talk about Dinosaurs, the weirdest show to air on ABC's TGI Friday's block next to such conventional shows as Full House and Boy Meets World. The concept for Dinosaurs originated with Jim Henson in the late 80s. He wanted to make a sitcom about a messy family in a flawed society that drives itself to extinction. His idea was The Last Days of the Dinosaurs, an idea that went nowhere for years because no one thought an idea like that could possibly work. But then a different show about a messy family happened. The Simpsons was a huge hit, and suddenly every network was looking for their own version of the same thing. For whatever reason, ABC decided that a show with giant animatronic dinosaur puppets fit the bill, and Dinosaurs was hatched. It's a standard sitcom set up a dumb dad named Earl, plucky wife named Fran, a teenager with an attitude named Robbie, proud daughter Charlene, and The Baby, a talking generator of catchphrases and merchandise. That there were similarities between the shows was not lost on anyone. These talking dinosaurs are more real than most real families on TV. It's like they saw our lives and put it right up on screen. From the start, the show did okay, not great, which meant that executives were fairly hands-off. The showrunners could tackle topics that might have been a little too edgy for Step by Step. The gay episode came at the start of season two, in late 1991, and it never explicitly references sexuality, but the metaphor is, at times, just blindingly obvious. It opens with some talk about the Young Men's Carnivore Association, the YMCA. I remember the day when I was initiated down at the Y. Made quite a meat eater of me. Yes, as the song says, the YMCA offers many ways to have a good time. So their son, Robbie, is supposed to be at the Y, participating in a manhood rite of passage, eating another dinosaur. But walking home with his friend Dave, he confesses he just couldn't go through with it. Yeah, some carnivore I turn out to be. Did you ever think that maybe you're a, a herbivore? No way! So this is the metaphor that the show's gonna go with. Herbivores are the outcasts of society. They're the ones looked down on, they're shunned. The show uses language in the scene that pretty clearly mirrors the kind of dialogue you'd hear in a very special episode about a gay kid. A lot of dinosaurs eat vegetables from time to time, including me. <gasps> are you sure? I mean, how long have you known? Well, I always kind of suspected. Ever since I was 12, you know, when I receive vegetables, yeah. I feel kind of hungry. There's just no ambiguity here about what they're talking about. It's almost identical to lines on other shows. How long have you known that you were gay? What, you think you have some sort of special lesbida or something? Okay, you know there's a better word for that, right? Dave even goes so far as to invite him to a gay bar. I'm sorry, a salad bar. I sneak out of the house on weekends, I go to this veggie place across town. Mm -hmm. Why don't you check it out with me sometime? Uh, no thanks. There's really nothing else this metaphor could be about. But then, in the next scene, things get a little murky. When Robbie gets home, everyone's about to sit down to a dinner of, uh, something dead, I'm not sure what, and Robbie starts asking some uncomfortable questions. Why should I rip apart some poor mastodon? Uh. Bigger eat smaller in the carnivore kingdom, that's the way it is! That's yeah. the way it's always been! So there you have it, Earl setting up some laws of nature. That's gonna be even more important later on. For now, the show's setting up that these parents are fairly conservative. Tradition matters in this house. They don't care for any changes to their carnivorous routine. Big eats small. Those are the rules. Don't question it unless you want to get into trouble. You know, it's possible to get nutrition from vegetables. Uh-oh. Well, it's happened, Franny. The green menace has crept into our very home. Okay, well, here's where the metaphor starts to get a little mushy. That line about the green menace is probably a reference to the red menace, a moral panic over communism that took place around the 1950s. 
you could maybe make a stretch and say it's a reference to the Lavender Scare, a moral panic over homosexuality that took place around the same time. But then Earl has this line. Are you now? Or have you ever been an herbivore? Well, that settles that. That line is almost a verbatim copy from the McCarthy hearings. Are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? So the episode's metaphor has gotten a little slippery. It was about homosexuality at first. Now it's about communism. And when the parents search Robbie's room, the metaphor slips again, and now it's about drugs. <gasps> Broccoli! Someone at school must have given it to him. I don't love that the show seems to be associating homosexuality with drug use, but it seems like what they're going for is just anything that parents might disapprove of. And that certainly seems to be the case at the gay bar, or the communist bar, or the drug bar. Robbie sneaks out to check out the scene, and Earl follows him. So it seems like we're back to the homosexuality metaphor. Oh, whoa, the old dinosaur is like totally herbophobic. But the bar's also full of hippie dinosaurs from the 60s, so maybe the metaphor is about counterculture now? The hippie vibe just seems kind of goofy today, but in 1991, the 60s were only like 20 to 30 years earlier, and adults watching the show might associate the 60s with the time when they were young and rebelled against their parents. And whether it's homosexuality or communism or drugs or long hair, parental conflict with kids is at the heart of this episode. Earl drags Robbie out to a swamp to show him how to kill and eat smaller creatures. Remember, bigger eats smaller. That's Earl's law of nature. Unfortunately, they didn't count on there being larger creatures than them in the swamp. A swamp monster appears and Hey, he looks familiar. Oh, yep, there he is. He's also appeared in the movie in a movie in 1989's Monster Maker. There's nothing particularly gay about this fact, I just think it's neat. Also, I like showing off my knowledge of Henson trivia. Anyway, Robbie gets eaten, and Earl trudges home to tell his wife their son is dead. It's grim, but Earl says there's nothing they can do. That's just the law of nature. Well, what do you want me to do, Franny? The laws of nature clearly state that... The bigger eat smaller. The laws of nature also state that we protect our young no matter what. Now, this is an interesting line for a couple of reasons. Remember, the relationship between parents and kids is central to this episode. And now that law of nature that Earl was so fond of, bigger eat smaller, it's taken a toll on his own family that he didn't expect. As a metaphor for homosexuality, I think this is actually a pretty strong moment. The parent whose conservative fundamentalist beliefs are so intense, they're willing to lose contact with their own child. But Fran's line about protecting their young no matter what is also interesting, and for a couple of reasons. One of which is that it echoes a 100-year-old theory about dinosaur behavior with some unexpectedly gay roots. When I was researching this video, I started to wonder if there was any connection between dinosaurs, the species, and homosexuality. And the first thing I found was this old forum post which insists that dinosaurs went extinct because they were all homosexual Satanists, which it just doesn't have the ring of scientific accuracy to it. But then I found something way more interesting. Picture it. Transylvania, 1895. A flamboyant 16-year-old aristocrat named Franz Nopcha von Felsho Schilvash takes an interest in some dinosaur bones that his younger sister found on their estate. He dives into a geological study of the surrounding land, and he gets a PhD in geology at the age of 26. His career advances, and then in 1906, he meets another geologist named Bayezid Doda. The two men fell in love, and they started working together. They went on fossil digs, they climbed mountains, they went on adventures. Franz discovered a species of turtle that he named Calocibotian Bayezidi, or Bayezid's beautiful box, because the shape of the shell reminded him of Bayezid's butt. So what is the connection between the gay dinosaur hunters of the 1800s and dinosaurs the sitcom? Well, in both cases, it comes down to family relationships. Now, we don't know exactly how open Franz and Bayezid were about being a couple. Some historians think that it was a case of everyone knew but nobody talked about it, which would make sense, since this was a time when many families were quite hostile to gay relatives. For example, in the 1890s, Oscar Wilde was seeing a man named Alfred Douglas, and when Alfred's father found out, he raised such a stink that Oscar was arrested and sent to prison. But as far as we can tell, Franz and Bayezid were on good terms with their families. For example, at one point, they went hiking in the mountains and were kidnapped by bandits. They started to put together an elaborate escape plan, but that turned out not to be necessary because when Bayezid's father found out what happened, he showed up with 50 armed guards to rescue them. So in contrast to what happened with Oscar and Alfred, 
Bayezid's dad looked out for his son and his partner, even when they got into trouble. And parents looking out for kids turned out to be an important part of Franz's work in paleontology. He was one of the first researchers to put forward a theory that dinosaur parents take care of their young, based in part in his belief, way ahead of its time, that dinosaurs were related to birds. Not many people believed him at first. It was a fringe theory for years. It really only took off in the 1980s and 1990s, and now it's generally believed he was right. Dinosaur parents, related to birds, really did look after their young. And now, here that theory is, brought to life a hundred years later on a silly puppet show. Even though they probably didn't have Franz Nopcha in mind when it was written, the show really does adhere to some of his ideas. Remember how Fran responded to her son getting eaten? Well, what do you want me to do, Franny? The laws of nature clearly state that the bigger eat smaller. The laws of nature also state that we protect our young no matter what. It is so weird to hear this sitcom explicitly validating the theories of Franz Nopcha a hundred years after he lived. It's also interesting to note that Franz introducing some ambiguity into what previously seemed like pretty fundamentalist conservative ideas about how they should live. Yes, there's a tradition that big things eat small things, but there's also a law about protecting their young. Now those two ideas are in conflict. She's saying that they're gonna have to choose which one to obey and which one to ignore. In other words, those old-fashioned traditional ideals might not be as immutable as they thought. Some values are more important than others. And if we're reading this as a metaphor for homosexuality and parental acceptance, she's saying that accepting their kid is more important than upholding old traditions. So Earl goes back to the swamp to rescue Robbie. He gets eaten by a previously owned hand puppet, finds his son in the creature's stomach. They start to fight, and there's what may be one of the most vividly off-color lines ever broadcast on television. Just tell me what it is that you have against me, and I will happily jump down this guy's intestines. Blech. Robbie's mad that Earl is so controlling. Earl is mad that Robbie doesn't listen to him, but then Earl realizes that this is pretty similar to the arguments that he had with his father. Well, maybe it's okay if sons have different ideas than their father's dad. Maybe it's how he evolved as dinosaurs. Yeah, well, maybe that's the law of nature. Aha, they've discovered a new law. As invested as Earl was in Bigger Eats Smaller, he's even more invested in a law that validates his own conflict with his dad. Like Fran, he's found a conflict between his values, and he's making a choice about which one to obey and which one to ignore. Problem solved. There's not much time left in the show, so it's time for an ending, the hastier the better. And it is very hasty. Earl and Robbie hug, which the swamp monster finds gross. That mushy stuff makes me nauseous. Cut it out. They realize that a display of male affection is so disgusting it'll make the swamp monster throw up. So they proclaim their love for each other as loudly as possible, forcing the monster to vomit and free them. It's not a great place for the episode to land that two men hugging is that disgusting. I don't love that ending, but in the epilogue, we do see that the family is now more live and let live about vegetables, whatever they represent. Meat and vegetables. Everyone can pick what they want. So what's this episode about? Drugs? Communism? Homosexuality? Hippies? I think at times it's about each of those things, but also there's something bigger at its heart, and that's how parents deal with the conflict of loving their kid while also disapproving of whatever the kid's into. It's about the choices parents make when their values are in conflict. In the case of Oscar Wilde, John Douglas decided that it was more important to attack homosexuality than to accept his son. With Bayezid and Franz, families stood by them, at least when their lives were threatened. And in this episode, the Sinclair parents both find that old traditions can threaten your family, and it's okay to part ways with those traditions in favor of better ones. I think that's a fairly optimistic ending, especially when you consider that three years later, the show ended with the entire cast dying. In the series finale, the characters are responsible for climate change and cause their own extinction. Daddy was put in charge of the world, and he didn't take real good care of it. And now it looks like there won't be much of a world left for you or your brother and sister to live in. Sometimes we see the dinosaurs, and by extension the humans for whom they're standing in, at their best, like when they accept their kids. And sometimes we see them at their worst, like when they cause mass extinction. Remember, from the start, Jim Henson's concept was the last days of the dinosaurs, and the show was always meant to show various ways the characters brought about their own destruction. Despite what you read on forums, no, homosexuality didn't kill the dinosaurs. In real life, the best science points to climate change caused by an asteroid or comet, maybe volcanoes. And on the show, we see the characters harmed by intolerance, slavish adherence to old traditions. Homosexuality, or vegetarianism in the episode's metaphor, didn't kill them, just the opposite. 
The survival of the family depends on getting over old prejudices about whatever you might be holding on to. I think if there's a message to all of these big foam suits, it's probably that humans ought to try to be a little more like the dinosaurs at their best, and less like the dinosaurs at their worst. Land ho, we're pulling into port. Thanks for cruising along with us, and thanks to everyone who makes Culture Cruise possible with a pledge of support on Patreon. If you're enjoying these videos, head over to patreon.com slash mattbaum, check out the rewards for backers, or just hit that subscribe bell. Ding ding. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm needed at the salad bar.